Let me invite you to take your Bibles this morning. Turn with me in the Old Testament, the book of Esther. We're going to continue our series through the book of Esther, a series that we are calling Unseen. Unseen. Esther is one of two books in the Bible where God is not mentioned by name. But obviously, as we walk through this text, we have seen that God is so present in all of it. And so this morning, Esther chapter 2, and we will begin in verse 21 in our text. So if you don't have a copy of the scriptures, when we read them in just a couple of moments, the verses will be on the screen. You can follow along with us there. Hey, here, are the, here were the most dreaded words when I was in school. Teacher steps to the front of the class, closes the door, turns around and says these words. Clear your desks, take out a sheet of paper and a pencil. I'm to everybody, like everybody knows, right? I mean, you feel like I'm not even in school right now, and telling that, telling that just makes my, my chest feel like it's caving in just a little bit, right? The dreaded pop quiz. Trials in life, I think, are a lot like pop quizzes. You never know when or from where they're going to come, right? And so, Let's begin this morning with this. Our lives are marked by a lot of things, but are marked by three distinguishing things. Sins, mistakes, and tragedies. Our lives are marked by sins, mistakes, and tragedies. Sins, meaning the sins that we commit against others, Sins that others commit against us, or maybe even sins that somebody committed that aren't against us, but yet they still affect us. Then mistakes. Not violations of God's law, but just bad decisions. Uh, you're working for this company, uh, you transfer to another company, they downsize and you lose your job, right? At the time that you took the job and made the transfer, uh, you thought it was a good move, <laughs> you took the information that you had, you made you thought what was a good decision ended up not being so good a decision. Tragedies. Things that, frankly, we just cannot fully explain. I say fully explain. Maybe we can't even begin to explain them. We don't know what's happening, why it's happening, or what God is doing. These are painful, hard circumstances that sometimes we see coming and sometimes we don't. Sins, mistakes, and tragedies. And where is God in the midst of all of that? Pick up with me in the text this morning, Esther chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. During those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the entrance, became infuriated and planned to assassinate King Ahasuerus. And when Mordecai learned of the plot, he reported it to Queen Esther, and she told the king on Mordecai's behalf. And when the report was investigated and verified, both men were hanged on the gallows. This event was recorded in the historical record in the king's presence. If you're a uh, Bible marker, you ought to underline and mark there, this event was recorded. It was written down. Chapter 3. After all this took place, King Ahasuerus honored Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite. He promoted him in rank and gave him a higher position than all the other officials. The entire royal staff at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman because the king had commanded this to be done. But Mordecai would not bow down or pay homage. The members of the royal staff at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why are you disobeying the king's command? And when they had warned him day after day, and he still would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see if Mordecai's actions would be tolerated, since he, Mordecai, had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai was not bowing down or paying him homage, he was filled with rage. And when he learned of Mordecai's ethnic identity, it seemed repugnant to Haman to do away with Mordecai alone, so he planned to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout Ahasuerus' kingdom. In the first month, the month of Nisan, in the king Hoshares' twelfth year, that being the pure, that is the lot, was cast before Haman for each day in each month, and it fell on the twelfth month, the month Adar. Then Haman informed king Ahasuerus, 
There is one ethnic group scattered throughout the peoples in every province of your kingdom, keeping themselves separate. Their laws are different from everyone else's, and they do not obey the king's law. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If the king so approves, let an order be drawn up authorizing their destruction, and I'll pay 375 tons of silver to the officials for deposit into the royal treasury. The king removed his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And then the king told Haman, the money and people are given to you to do with as you see fit. And so the royal scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and the order was written exactly as Haman commanded. It was intended for the royal satraps, the governors of each of the provinces, and the officials of each ethnic group, and written for each province in its own script and to each ethnic group in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the royal signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to each of the royal provinces telling the officials to destroy, to kill, and annihilate all the Jewish people, young and old, women and children, and to plunder their possessions on the single day, the 13th day of Adar, the 12th month. A copy of the text issued as law throughout every province was distributed to all the people so that they might get ready for that day. The couriers left spurred on by royal command, and the law was issued in the fortress of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink while the city of Susa was in confusion. Here's the big idea. Trials, trials reveal what is already present in our lives while providing an opportunity for us to grow in our faith at the same time. Trials in our lives reveal what's already there, right? COVID didn't create something new, right? It just revealed so much that was already there in our hearts and in our culture. And so trials reveal what is already present in our lives while providing an opportunity to grow in our faith at the same time. In every trial, there are two things that are happening simultaneously. Here it is. In every trial, two things happening at the same time. Number one, there's the temptation to run out from under that trial and to blame God and to blame somebody else. It's always somebody else's fault. So first temptation in a trial is to run out from under it and put the blame somewhere else. Secondly, happening at the same time is the opportunity to choose to embrace the opportunity to grow. There is a tension that happens in our life. Am I going to run out from under this, or am I going to choose to grow? Charles Swindoll wrote this, and I quote him. He said, life and pain are synonymous. Pain is inevitable. Misery is optional. Now, some of us need to write that down and highlight it and memorize it. And then, like, chew the paper up that it's on and swallow it and internalize it. Pain is inevitable, misery is optional. He goes on, since we cannot get free of pain, the secret of successful living is finding ways to live above the level of misery. So let's go back and talk about the context of what's happening here in the scriptures. At this point, Esther is now queen, and Mordecai has a decision to make. King Ahasuerus, that's his Persian name, Xerxes is his Greek name. So Xerxes, Ahasuerus, we've realized and learned over the last couple weeks, he's a bad man. And I don't mean like a bad man, like a cool bad man. I mean like a wicked bad man, okay? He's a bad man. And so Mordecai overhears a plot to assassinate the wicked king, right? And so Mordecai has a decision to make. Is he going to do a good thing for a bad man? Will he say something and spare the king's life? Or will he continue to remain silent and allow Xerxes to be murdered? Well, we've already read the text, so we know what he decided to do. He decided to speak up, and he saves the king's life. So everything's good, right? I mean, in verse 22, it tells us, in chapter 2, it tells us that, that Mordecai told Esther, the queen, hey, somebody's trying to kill the king. Everything's good, right? According to verse 23, the king's people investigate the information, and they find out that it's true. And so the Bible tells us there that the details of this situation were written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. So this is like the scrapbook. These are like the king's scrapbooks, right? It's like a, 
chronological rendering of all that has gone on. They said, he said, hey, write it down, right? Let's remember this is significant. Somebody was trying to kill the king. Somebody spared his life. Mordecai uncovered the plot. Let's write that down, right? That's something you ought to remember. And so Xerxes knew exactly who was going to kill him, and he also knew exactly who had saved his life. And so Mordecai's discovery of the plot to, to assassinate the king, his, his discovery of this is by God's design, not by Mordecai's wisdom. I mean, truth be told, Mordecai just happened to be in the right place at the right time. We would say, oh, how coincidental. No, we would say, how providential of God working that out. And so the verse is pivotal because it brings Mordecai into the good graces of the king and it foreshadows his later reward and exaltation. You see, Mordecai foiled an assassination plot by reporting it to Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving due credit to Mordecai. So the historical records refer to an official record in the Persian archives naming the king's benefactors. And Mordecai's name is in that record. You see, acts of loyalty would usually be rewarded immediately and generously by the king. But Mordecai's reward was apparently overlooked, right? So, I mean, we close chapter 2 with Mordecai having foiled the plot to assassinate the king and with it being written down in the king's scrapbooks. When we turn the page, literally, to chapter 3, it says, after all this took place, I'm thinking... After all this took place, Mordecai's going to get elevated, right? He's going to, they're going to recognize him, you know, put him on the shoulders and carry him down the streets and have a ticker tape parade, right? No, it says, after all this took place, King Ahasuerus honored Haman? What did Haman do? The Bible says that the city was in confusion. You see, Esther became queen in the seventh year of Ahasuerus' reign, and Haman conspires against the Jews in the 12th year, right here in chapter 3, verse 7. So there's a five-year period of time. Somewhere in this five-year period, Mordecai uncovers this assassination plot, and Haman rises to power. Now, Ahasuerus, the king, he does not reward Mordecai. I mean, think about it. Surely in five years, the king could find some time to have at least said, hey, somebody, would you write a thank you note to Mordecai for saving my life? Like, he didn't even have to write it himself. Just have somebody else do it. At the very least, you would think in five years that he would have found some time to say, hey, appreciate it, bro. Rather, he promotes Haman, who we're going to learn this morning is the mortal enemy, not only of, of Mordecai, but Haman is the mortal enemy. His people are the mortal enemy of the Jews. And so when the Jews, when they would have heard of Haman's promotion, they would have said, Haman... He's an Agagite, and they are our enemies. Like of all of the people on the face of the earth, not an Agagite, not our mortal enemy. <laughs> and so in the Old Testament, when God newly formed the nation of Israel, the first people to attack Israel and to try to destroy them are a group of people called the Amalekites. And here's what we're going to learn in just a minute. Haman is a descendant of King Agag, who was of the people of the Amalekites. So the very first people group that tried to destroy the Jews as a nation, now their long-lost relative is in a position to bring them great harm. And so you got all of a sudden... You got Mordecai saving the king's life, and his new boss is his mortal enemy. Can you see the tension going on there? There is no explanation of why Haman deserved such an honor. John Piper wrote in, in, on this text, he said, We may be forgotten by man, but we are remembered by God. Now listen, while Mordecai went unrewarded for quite some time, the man who would eventually attempt to eliminate the Jews was rising to a position where he could actually do something. He could actually push forward and do something with these threats. And so here's the problem. Haman sits on his throne and he says, everybody bow down before me. Mordecai is present at the gate and what does Mordecai refuse to do? He refuses to bow down. I'm not bowing down to an 
to him? I'm not bowing down to, to my enemy. You got a whole bunch of people bowing, and Mordecai's just giving Haman the stink eye. I mean, Haman's life is good, right? He's been elevated to power. The king gave him his signet ring, which is basically that like power of attorney for the kingdom. Okay? He's elevated in position. King said, yep, you take care of all that. Yep, tell everybody they got to bow down to you. That's, I'm good to go with that. So he's got a throne. He's ruling. He's reigning. And everybody's supposed to bow down to him. And everybody does bow down to him except this one guy. There's always one in the crowd, right? And so what does Haman do? He becomes obsessed. And what does he become obsessed with? That one guy. He's got all of this, but that one guy. I mean, we get like that, right? Everything in life going pretty well, except for one thing. And that's what we obsess over. I mean, we can't see God's goodness and God's grace and God's blessings in our life because of the one thing. And that is what we freak out about. And that one thing is what we get obsessed about. So look, the locals, they come to Mordecai and they're like, hey, what? why aren't you bowing down like the rest of us? He tells them, I'm a Jew, I'm not going to do it. And so they think, well, they'll broker some peace. So the locals that says they go to Mordecai, excuse me, they go to Haman, and they were like, maybe we, can, maybe we can get everybody to get along, right? We'll just tell him. It says there they went to see if Mordecai's reason would be acceptable. Can you imagine how that conversation went? Hey, Haman, I realize you're the most powerful, you know, second into the king, and everybody's supposed to bow down to you. And I know this one guy over here is not... He's the exception to the rule, right? I mean, here's why he says he can't do it. Are you going to be okay with that? It's okay if he doesn't bow down. That just is not going to fly. And so Haman decided that not only would he make an example of Mordecai, but he would, he would eliminate all of Mordecai's people. Mordecai had gotten his feelings hurt, and he was going to make a statement using nonviolent social protest. Everybody else is going to bow, I'm going to stand. Right? Not going to say anything, just going to stand. Nonviolent social protest. But it backfires on him because Haman winds up becoming the first Hitler. This is a plot for genocide. Haman has decided that he is going to destroy an entire community of people primarily because they are God's covenant people. And so Haman was promoted in Mordecai's spot. He's given the king's signet ring and permission to do with the Jews as he pleased. I mean, how did he get that way? Well, think about it. How do you tell a story in such a way that it benefits you? We are all good at this. Think about it. Here's what Haman did. He runs to the king and he tattles on Mordecai without using his name, yet he implicates all of the Jews. Rather than saying, hey, king, I got an issue with this one guy. He says, king, there's a whole group of people living in your kingdom that follow a different set of laws. It is not in your best interest for them to continue. Oh, king, I'll take care of this for you. If it's okay with you, you issue the decree, I'll get rid of them and all, and not only will I take care of it for you, but I will make a hefty donation to your reelection campaign. He leads the king to believe that so, total social anarchy, like the kingdom's going to fall apart if we don't annihilate all these people. He says they're kind of like Vashti. They said no to the king, and this isn't good for you. I'm just looking out for you. If it pleases you, then let it be decreed that they be destroyed. You see, you, you can always tell the story in your favor. And so Haman cuts a deal with the king. He promises to pay the king for this work. Now, my text said it was 375 tons of silver. Think about it now. He said, King, I'll take care of these rebels for you. Right? I'll get rid of these nuisances so they don't cause you any trouble. You just issue the decree. I'll make certain that they all get killed. And in addition to that, I'll make a hefty contribution. And so I got to ask myself, well, where would he have gotten 375 tons of silver from? out of the pockets of the dead Jews. You see, this kind of person does not, is not, he ain't paying for this out of his own pocket. And this is not out of the generosity of his heart. It would be from the pockets of the dead Jews. 
And so think about it. King Ahasuerus, he doesn't do his homework. He doesn't get both sides of the stories. He only hears Haman's report about the people. And he goes, hey, that's a great plan. I like the way you think, Haman. Here's my signet ring. Here's power of attorney. You now have control over life and death. And so the king's unchangeable edict is this. Kill all of God's people. The Bible tells us here that they wrote it down in the language and in the script of every people group in the kingdom, and they, they mailed it out. They sent it certified letter. I don't know about you, but at this point, my heart is screaming. It's not right. You can't treat people this way. My, my theological mind begins to go, my, my, my faith-based mind begins to go, God, where are you at? Because no, God doesn't, he doesn't, there's not like a thunder from heaven. There's not a prophet that comes walking into town and says, whoa, thus saith the Lord, you can't do this, knucklehead. There's none of that. I mean, where is God in all of this? He doesn't speak. He doesn't stop the things. The evil plan continues to unfold. Think about it. Look in chapter 3 and verse 14. I mean, one of the most ominous verses in, all the t in the Bible says, A copy of the text issued as law throughout every province was distributed to all the people. Look what it says. So that they might get ready for that day. The people knew what had been decided. Everyone knew what was coming. The calendar had been marked. You know, if, if you're like our family, have a... You got at least one paper calendar somewhere. The pantry door, the refrigerator, somewhere, right? And you got all these things on it. And so we put birthdays, vacations, significant moments, right? And we count down. You ask a kid how many days it is to their birthday. It's, it's 122 and a half days until my birthday. How do they know that? Because they have counted the number of blocks it is on the calendar until that star for their birthday. And right here in the text, they put a star on the day. Everybody knew it was coming. Now listen, Haman was not only hurtful, but Haman was calloused. Hear, hear me on this, students. At the close of chapter 3, we find him enjoying a drink with the king. I mean, think about it. How cold is this cold-blooded murderer? He cuts a deal, gets it all taken care of. The decree goes out. I mean, can you imagine the weeping and the crying and the, the mourning in the streets and in the communities where people just found out they've been sentenced to die? Because this man got his feelings hurt and this guy decided to make an example of everybody because the two of them can't figure out how to get along. I go, it's not right. It's a tragedy. And the Bible says that just as calm and cool as he could be, Haman sat down and had a drink with the king while the city was in utter chaos. Hear me. Hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. And meanness always has a history. Meanness always has a history. In Exodus chapter 17, the Malachites attacked the Jews. And Moses said to the people, said, listen, you go out and you fight, and I will hold the, rock, the, the Lord's staff up, and as long as I hold the staff up, we'll win. And the battle goes on, and the Bible says that Moses is standing there, and think about it now, I mean, even a strong guy, even you strong, strapping young guys, eventually that shoulder is going to get tired, right? And the Bible said that when Moses let his hand down, then the Amalekites began to win and began to take over. But when he lifted the staff back up, then the Israelites won. And so just imagine, up, oh, tired, leg it down, up, oh, I'm get it back up, right? You know, eventually he's standing there. Now this is the glorious text in Exodus chapter 17 where Moses, excuse me, where Aaron and Hur put stones under Moses' arms. And the Bible says that Aaron and Hur actually helped hold his arms up while the people fought. They were fighting the Amalekites. 
the first people that tried to annihilate them. In that same battle, God told Moses to tell the people that he would annihilate and he would wipe out the Amalekites and they would never bother them again. That was a promise from God. You force forward into 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now the Israelites, they want a king. They want to be like all the other, all the other nations around them. And so the first king that they have is a guy named Saul. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul is leading the Israelites into battle and they are battling against King Agag, who is a descendant of the Amalekites. And the Lord told Saul to annihilate everybody. Wipe the place clean. Kill them all. Men, women, children, cows, donkeys, you name it. He said, wipe them all clean. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15 that Saul made the decision not to kill King Agag. You see what's happening here? So Saul disobeyed God. And we come here now to Esther chapter 3. And Haman, the great, great, great grandson of King Agag. You think that family hadn't told that story? I mean, the Hatfields and the McCoys and the Montagues and the Capulets got nothing on this. You, you think that story hadn't been told over and over about that group of people that tried to annihilate us? And so, here in Esther chapter 3, Haman accused an anonymous group about being indifferent, being disobedient in their behavior, and he urged the king not to tolerate them. <laughs> One writer described it this way, he said, I don't know how God perfects plans that seem so bleak to us in the process, but I know two things. He never takes his eye off of us or the clock ticking over us, and he's hard at work in your life, and the same eye that's on the sparrow is on the wristwatch. An assault on God's covenant people at any time in human history is really an attack on the power and the character and the nature of God himself. And so although neither God nor Satan is mentioned by name in the book of Esther, there is a force at work directing the mighty power of the Persians against God's people. However, there is an even greater sovereign power who is at work at the same time protecting and preserving his people. First John chapter four, and verse, chapter 4 and verse 4 says this, greater is he, Christ, who is in me than he, Satan, who is in the world. So at this point though, I'm just wanting to scream at it. It's, it's not right. It should not be this way. Now listen, I told you at the beginning of the sermon that three things painfully mark our lives, sins, mistakes, and tragedies. And they are everywhere in this story. I've identified at least 15. I'm going to run through them real fast. At least 15 things. Some are sins, some are mistakes, and some are tragedies. Some of them are a combination of two or all three of those. But here's the big idea. It shouldn't be happening. It should not be like this. The Jews should not be in this situation. Let's run through them. Number one. See, generations prior to Esther, God's people should not have continued in sin so that they would not have been exiled. They should have never had to leave Jerusalem, but they were disciplined. The whole reason they're in Persia is because previous generations had sinned against God. Sometimes stuff in your life that is most painful was made by generations before you were born, but it implicates and it affects you. And so had the previous generations of Jews not sinned against the Lord, they wouldn't have been exiled to Babylon, and the Jews weren't supposed to be there in the first place. They were supposed to be in Jerusalem. Number two, once freed, all of God's people should have obeyed Isaiah and returned back to Jerusalem. So they shouldn't have been down there to begin with, but even so, they still, when they were freed, they should have gone home to Jerusalem. But not everybody obeyed. And so some of the Jews... We're still there. They should not have been in Persia at this time. Number three, the death of Esther's parents was tragic. We don't know, we don't, we don't know how they died, but I think it'd be fair to say that any time a child loses both mother and father, it is absolutely devastating. Number four, Esther and Mordecai should have been walking faithfully with God. But so far, up until this point in the text, we don't see them praying, we don't see them reading the scriptures. 
We don't see them, them offering sacrifices. We don't see them talking to God. Nothing. Nothing of faith. They're not walking with God. Number five, Esther and Mordecai should not have concealed their faith so long. At some point, they should have gone public. At some point, they should have spoke up and said, we believe in God. We are followers of Yahweh. And had they done that, the decree to kill them likely would not have gone out to destroy all the Jews. Because who was a Jew? Esther. What positions was she in? She was queen. I really, do, I really think that when, 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 if Haman had let it be known, right, if, he, if, if the king knew that Esther was a Jew, his wife, the one he chose, and now this guy wants to kill all his people, all her people, including her, I would think that he would have put him in his place. Number six, Ahasuerus should never have divorced his wife Vashti to begin with. He didn't have grounds for it. She didn't deserve it. He should have sucked his pride up and apologized. Number seven, Xerxes should never have taken the bad counsel from the people that told him to get rid of uh, Esther and I mean uh, Vashti and replace her to begin with. He should have never had them round up the young ladies and treat them as possessions. That should have never happened. Number eight, Mordecai should not have allowed Esther to enter this competition to be the next queen. She's likely a teenager at this time. Hundreds of women are going to sleep with the king back in the earlier text, and Mordecai let Esther go. Now think about it. Now in the text today, he's willing to die on the hill of not bowing down to Haman. So that's where he drew the line at. Not the sanctity and the purity of this young girl who had been, in, had been given into his trust. I mean, if you want to die for a noble cause, make it the cause of a young woman's purity, especially when she's your adoptive daughter. Mordecai should have fought for her. He should have died defending her. But he didn't. Number nine, Esther should not have slept with a pagan king. He should not have done it. I'm not necessarily saying it's entirely her fault. I'm just saying it was wrong. It should not have happened. Number 10, Esther shouldn't have been the queen of Persia. I mean, she shouldn't have been there anyhow, right? So she shouldn't have become queen. Number 12, Mordecai probably should have just gone ahead and bowed down to Haman. I mean, a little bow of respect and honor is common in, in that culture. Haman, number 13, Haman should never have been born. I mean, let's think about this for a second. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I'm not sure why we were laughing, um, but I, I, I think I do. But anyhow, so <laughs> Jack said that was just cold, right? Think with me just a second. Haman should have never been born. Theologically, this is true. Think about it. Haman was the descendant of whom? Agag. Remember, Saul, he was a Malachite. Saul was supposed to have destroyed, killed all of the Amalekites, including King Agag. So Agag should not have been alive to foster a family of his lineage. But Saul disobeyed. He didn't kill them all. He let Agag live. And so since Mordecai's great-great-great-great-grandfather didn't kill Haman's great-great-great-great-grandfather, like the Lord said, now Haman's going to try to kill Mordecai, and Haman should have never been born to start with. Number 14, Haman should not have sought to take out his wrath against all the Jews. You got a problem with one person, you deal with that. What Haman was doing was racism, which is sinful. Number 15, Xerxes should never have given his signet ring and unlimited authority to Haman without checking out the facts first. Now, you can probably find more in the text that you say this shouldn't have happened, but here's what I can say. It's all wrong. It's not supposed to be this way. This shouldn't have been happening. So here's the conclusion. If God is all-powerful and good, why does he allow suffering and evil? If God is sovereign, as we have seen and shown, not only in this, in, this, in this book, but throughout all the scriptures, if God is God, why did this happen? 
Listen to me. We experience evil and suffering not because God is not good, but because people are sinful. Evil and suffering and sin and sickness and death and war and famine and disease are a result of the fall of sin entering into the human condition. Not because God is not good, but because there are consequences for our sin. Secondly, suffering has a redemptive quality in our lives. Now, we don't like to think like this, but suffering has a redemptive quality in our lives. The Apostle Paul said and wrote in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, he said, listen this, this, he said, that I might know Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings. I don't know about you, but I tend to learn lessons better when they're hard. Because I don't want to do it again. So suffering has a redemptive quality in our lives. C.S. Lewis wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences, but he shouts in our pain. He says, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Thirdly, suffering causes our eschatological hopes to mature. That's 75 cent word that means this. Suffering in this life makes me long for the return of Jesus. Eschatology, the study of end times, eschatological. Suffering causes our hope in the return of Christ to mature. Fourthly, God disciplines his people through pain and suffering to bring us close to his purposes. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, suffering leads to maturity, that leads to proven character, that leads to hope. And he says, hope does not disappoint because it is in Jesus. James, in chapter, James chapter 1, verse 2 through 5, he, he says, uh, count it all joy, my friends, when you, encary, and when you encounter various kinds of trials because they are used to perfect Christ's character in you and to make you mature in all things. So what is the answer to all of this? The gospel. The gospel. You know, preacher, that's just a little too simple. Stick with me. There is an intonation of hope in the text. Listen to me. We miss it because the calendar for the Jews was different than our calendar today. Now stick with me on this. In chapter 3, in Esther chapter 3, verses 7 and 13, the text gives us some indications of the timing of when all of this is coming about. Right? It lets us know what day the, the decree was issued. It lets us know what day they were going to be annihilated. And so Haman's decree for the murder of God's people is actually sent out on the eve of what we know as Passover. Which goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 12 and the Jews' salvation and deliverance from Pharaoh and Egypt. Now, it's a different nation. It's Persia this time, it was Egypt then. It's a different ruler. It's Xerxes now, it was Pharaoh then. But it's the same thing. There is one who is worshipped like a god, ruling over God's people and abusing them. And so the story of Esther is a part of the bigger story. For you deep thinkers, it's a part of the meta-narrative of all that God is doing. Esther is a part of a bigger story about an even greater king. And so this king is the creator of the world. This king is worthy of our worship, not Ahasuerus, not, not Xerxes, but the king of kings. He's worthy of our worship. He's given us good laws to follow so that we might live life to its fullest. But you and I have not followed his laws the way that we should have. And so this king of kings, he has far more reason to act against us than Ahasuerus had to act against the Jews. He said, we have rebelled against this king. We have committed treason 
against the King Jesus. We have done everything we can to dethrone the King of Kings so that we can have control of our own lives. And that is why this King has every reason to treat us like his enemies. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we once were all dead in our trespasses and sins, living to the lust of our flesh, doing the thing that we wanted to do. And the Bible says right there, and we were enemies of God's wrath. One of the most hope-filled verses in all the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, but God who is rich in his grace and mercy with which he has loved us. You see, king, the king of kings had every reason to treat us like his enemies. We also have an enemy who is far greater than Haman, who loves to come before God and to present God all the reasons why it would be in God's best interest to destroy us and to give up on us. The Bible calls our enemy the accuser. Just like Haman, he loves to accuse us before the king. And so this means that if God were anything like King Ahasuerus, he would have sent out a decree for our destruction and then sat down and had a drink. But the book of Esther comes to tell us that our king is not like Ahasuerus. So where Ahasuerus takes money to destroy an innocent people, God gives his only son in order to save rotten sinners. And so that's, that's why in the Bible, it's not the Jews who are destroyed and killed and annihilated. Rather, it is God's only son who is nailed to a cross and annihilated in death. It is God's only son who hung upon a cross while his few earthly goods were plundered by men who rolled dice for his clothes. He's the one that was killed so that our great king set us free. Romans chapter 3 verses 23 through 25, Paul says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God deals with the sins, the mistakes, and the tragedies. He deals with the evil through the gospel of Jesus. It was not in spite of the greatest injustice and evil against Jesus that God worked, but rather it was through that very injustice that God worked. And so God does not waste a moment or a season in mine and your life. There is no sin, no mistake, no tragedy that by his grace he cannot redeem and cover by the blood of Jesus. It's the good news. The good news of the gospel is the only sufficient answer for all of our sins, our mistakes, and our tragedies. I, I don't know where you're walking at this morning. I don't, know, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what sin or what mistake or what tragedy may be, may be causing you to doubt God's goodness and God's love for you, to, to doubt God's ability and his grace to redeem your life. I don't know what you're walking through today. I don't know what is overwhelming you today. I don't know what part of your life you're struggling to be able to see God or to understand what he is doing, but I do know this. Just as in the day of Esther and Mordecai, so today God is alive. He has a plan. And if you will trust him, he will save you. Amen. Period. It is finished. Sometimes it is so stinking hard and difficult and painful and confusing when we see all that goes on around us and we go, that's not right. That shouldn't have happened. Oh my stars, what in the world? But to be reminded that through the gospel, through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God bore it all. 
for your salvation. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. My friend, I plead with you with all that is within me and based upon the truth of God's righteous character that wherever you are walking at today, you would make the decision right now this morning that you are going to begin trusting God. I'm not saying you got to figure all the questions out and have all the answers before you walk out of this room because that's not that, that just won't happen most likely. But I promise you that the first step has to be one of faith. To say, God, I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus. And today I am trusting you. And then I'm going to walk in the days and the weeks and the months and the years ahead. I'm going to walk in this season and in the future seasons. I'm going to walk in that faith, trusting you. So as we stand and sing... Trevor and I are going to be standing right here in the front. If you would like to speak with someone, you'd like to talk with and say, hey, I need to trust Jesus. How do I do this? I need to trust God. How do I do this? We want to help you to take that step of trust and faith. If you need somebody to pray with, we want to pray with you. But let us respond in a surrendered trust and faith. God in heaven, thank you, God. Thank you. Praise be to your name that you are in control and you are working everything for our good and for your glory. And so this morning, God...